Uh, my name is Jamie Johnston. I'm head of global systems at Bryden Woods. Uh, and thanks, Phil, for inviting me to be, to be here. It feels like we're a really good company, actually. Um, as a company, we work with Gammon um, out in Hong Kong. So good to see those guys. And uh, you're going to hear next from John Lowe and IPD, who we also work closely with. So um, for anyone who hasn't come across Bryden Wood previously, we are an integrated uh, design consultants. We started out as architects, but we've grown since then into uh, lots of different disciplines and other things outside of kind of normal construction consultancy. The thing we're probably best known for and originally set out to, to look at was um, how to get all the benefits of manufacturing into construction. So industrialized construction or modern methods of construction, design to manufacture assembly, you know, there's lots of terms around this, but the sort of guiding principle is how can you make construction better uh, productivity, lower cost, quicker, higher quality, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been doing this for 26 years now. This is a snapshot of lots of different projects we've worked on. And you can see there's no kind of one uh, right type of DFMA. We use volumetric, panelized, componentized. We have a sort of range of systems. We're material agnostic. We use timber, steel, concrete. Um, and we're very, very cross sector. So here you can see solutions for uh, aviation, education, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, data centers, water infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure. So um, we've tried as a company to break all of the traditional silos that exist between sectors and between disciplines and between design and construction. I think that's one of the huge problems that um, the industry faces. And that's why I think we haven't managed to make this sort of transformational leap that everyone's been uh, interested in for a long time. So <clears throat> on that thing, one of the things that we've looked at um, I think whereas lots of other people in the industry focus on the differences between sectors or the specific bits that, that make their part of the construction ecosystem kind of special, we've been looking for commonality. So as I say, we've worked in lots and lots of sectors. And one of the things we've been trying to do is identify what we would call rules and patterns. So rules are, say, the statutory guidance, the... Uh, technical guidance that clients and government has around buildings. Patterns are the things that we see where having followed those designers converge on particular types of solutions. So for instance, there's only so many ways to lay out a one bed flat and it's not necessarily written anywhere that's how you do it, but because of the constraints in size and things, people converge on these answers. So we've been trying to, to understand what those look like across sectors. From that, we can then start to derive uh, you've seen lots of examples of DFMA. We've been trying to crystallize that into what is the, the kit of parts that would allow you to build everything? What's the Lego kit of parts or IKEA kit of parts of construction? And if you understood all of the rules that, gu that guided them, how could you start to automate the construction process? How could you uh, document those? You've seen some really good examples of digital tools. And I think that's a huge thing that's obviously expanding in the industry. Um, so in, in our heads, there's a whole series of uh, workflows or tools which are being brought to bear. And you've seen some of them, you're gonna see more of them later, but they all kind of get centered on this you know, use of data. And from that, then we think components and configurators and all of the things, you know, BIM used to be at the center of this diagram. I think BIM is now one view of that data, but we're also seeing you know, VR and AR and computational design, IoT and all these other things are starting to, to feed into this. So we think this is a, a better model or a better way of thinking maybe than the kind of uh, existing sort of transactional linear design process. So we've been working hard on this over a number of years. We've now got a whole range of these uh, computational design workflows or uh, algorithmic workflows, genetic algorithms and things for all sorts of different sectors. And they're all quite different because they're all trying to do uh, something quite, uh, what we're always trying to resolve is the, the sort of uh, make sure that the use of kind of common components and standard ways of working doesn't impinge on your design freedom and design flexibility. So we're always trying to solve that tension that automotive does very well around how do I make things uh, very site specific and, you know, client specific whilst leveraging all the benefits of standardization. So all of these um, configurators are sort of different tools for people at different stages of the project, but they have this underlying thing of how can I speed up the process? I think our view is we haven't got time, you know, the amount of social infrastructure, for instance, we need to build in the next 20 years with population growth and climate crisis and 
skills gap and poor productivity construction, we haven't simply haven't got time to design and build things in the way that we have done for the last 2000 years. Uh, these tools we think are, you know, a first opening statement in a debate about how do we change the design process to make it much, much quicker and much, much better. Um, so I'll give you some examples. The first one I'm going to show is a thing we did for um, Department for Education here in the UK. So that's a, a department which has incredible wealth of knowledge about all of the space types that, that create the best education environment, how they should go together, uh, what are the component parts that make a school, but each school was being designed relatively traditionally, so every time they needed to, to design a school, they'd get a site, they would do a feasibility study, because it's a feasibility study, people would do quite a high level design, and then when they did the proper design, they would find that, you know, say you can't quite fit three classrooms in that space, or you would either start compromising the quality of the um, teaching space, or you'd start the design process again. So we took that away and said, well, actually, you are an organization that knows, you know, an incredible amount about your estate. If we can start to capture those rules and patterns, codify that, we could then create the digital kit of parts that would allow you to design a school incredibly quickly. You could only ever design a compliant school because the, the components won't let you break the rules. Uh, you could take what is normally a kind of, you know, a sort of month long study and do it in 15 minutes. And I've got a particular interest in how do we make construction interesting for the next generation. So given all of those challenges I've talked about, if we don't encourage the next generation to come into construction, then we really have got a problem because there's no one left to design our uh, infrastructure. So we deliberately geared this towards uh, the Minecraft generation. We actually beat tests on my then nine year old son. Uh, and when we released it, this is it's open source. The code is all uh, freely available. You can download it, you can play with it. But uh, to, to prove the point, we took this into a school in North London. And this is a, a group of nine year olds who have never seen this app and have never designed a school. And literally within 20 minutes, they could design you a completely code compliant school. So you basically plug in some key uh, parameters. You, it's, it's, it, it uses open source street mapping. So you can pick a site anywhere in the country, delete the buildings, take your kit of parts, and then you simply place them on the site and off you go. So we have, uh, each one has its own little sort of quite digital uh, detailed model. It's designed so that you can't, as I say, put things in the wrong place. You can't put a, a classroom above a, a sports hall, for instance, you can only follow the rules. Um, and then when you've done that, you export it and it starts your BIM workflow. So this proves, I think, the, uh, how quickly you can design these things and actually how the next generation already knows how to do this. I mean, our job is to get the industry ready for them because if we don't, they won't come. If we do, they will do incredible things with all the digital stuff that, that's been talked about. So um, that's probably the most straightforward of them. Uh, completely different version. This was for Highways England, uh, their Smart Motorways programme. Uh, can I just pause that for a second to give you some context? So <clears throat> this was taking, um, this is in the UK, they're taking, we have what's called a hard shoulder, which is a kind of uh, breakdown lane, which is only used for emergencies, but cars don't break down as often as they used to. So there's an initiative to start to use those lanes for additional capacity and to make interventions in the existing motorway. That was taking, uh, say, six months to do a feasibility study. But again, highways know an incredible amount about all their components. So we developed an algorithmic workflow, which uh, you give it a section of road. Uh, oh, sorry, let's come back. Sorry, I'll play that again. <clears throat> it takes a stretch of road, it analyzes it for a whole load of features around curvature and gradient and uh, visibility, etc. So it builds up a kind of, say, mental picture of what the road is like. And then because it, every, it knows how every component needs to relate to each other component and to the road, it can then populate that with all the things you would need to do in terms of signage and uh, emergency refuge areas. So it populates that automatically. It does a better job than people because it checks every single visibility distance for every millimeter of road for instance uh, and it does this in say a day two days compared to six months so you get a better quality output in just a fraction of the time uh, and it then generates a massive data set for lots of different stakeholders and it just it's transformed I think uh, Highways England's view of 
their client capability, but also how they do these major bits of infrastructure. And it's freed up the design teams to not spend all their time doing the kind of grunt of the straight bits of road. They can spend more time on the more value adding complex problems. Um, this is the last one of these I'll show you. This is our housing um, app, again, open source. We developed it for the Mayor of London. This is designed to allow uh, designers to generate feasibility studies very quickly, but also test what forms of modern methods construction are most suitable for different housing developments. So you can take a blank site, plug in some key parameters, design yourself a, uh, say, initial design. We then export that data and we can then plug that into a whole load of simulation software so we can look at vertical sky and overshadowing, overlooking and pedestrian movements and things. So, again, we're using that speed of these tools to test more ideas and do more simulation and come up with better solutions. So whereas a, a traditional team might try one or two ideas, we can test 50, 60 different ideas, really optimise for a whole range of functions. and. Again, I think this is a, a powerful example of using the, these tools not to automate people out of jobs, but to do better design. And when you've got a design you're happy with, you then press the button, it goes and gets the uh, MMC components, populates it. You go to into a sort of you know building bill of materials quality model in you know 20 minutes. So again, massive acceleration in speed of design, but also we think better design overall. So that brings me on to what you know. What are the components we're developing around this? So, as I say, uh, the other the, the physical side of the, this equation is looking across these sectors and trying to identify common components. The best example I can think of is IKEA. So everyone knows IKEA. You, you know, whether you're building a wardrobe or a chest of drawers or a bookshelf or whatever, the components are often the same. The process is always the same. The book looks the same. You only ever need an Allen key and a, a maybe a screwdriver. So that's what we're after in construction to so say, if we boiled down everything we know about all these assets, what would be the kind of core kit of components that would allow us to build everything? So we've been looking at this, we describe them as platforms, which is a term we've taken from automotive. Uh, the numbers here are not that relevant. They we use the numbers just to describe the kind of typical spans. But we've been developing for a variety of clients now a whole series of these from uh, sort of super low cost rapid housing, uh, prison cells for our Ministry of Justice and single living accommodation for the army, a kind of mid span platform that does most of government as you'll uh, or public sector procurement as you'll see. Platform three is our sort of next step up. It's the kind of big commercial office and platform four is kind of big empty sheds. But between those kits of parts, there's not many things that you can't sort of readily build. Um, uh, looking for that commonality, you can see across the platforms, there's a whole series of things which are completely common. So some of them are the physical things like the actual components we use. Uh, so that's your sort of IKEA knockdown fittings. Some of them are the process things. So the use of robotics or color coding, those are your kind of IKEA manual and your say hex key, Allen key. Um, but the, the kind of cross sectors means that as soon as we've learned something in one sector, so if we learn something in commercial office, we can instantly deploy it in education or healthcare, for instance, which is how we're going to start to move the industry forward very quickly. We think that's the kind of continual improvement thing that that um, uh, manufacturing does, that construction doesn't. So I've only got a couple of minutes left. I'll skim through some of these. The first project that's properly deploying these in the private sector is for a company called Landsect, who are UK's largest developer. Um, because of that commonality of components, we're able to place uh, automation properly in construction. So we think that robots have a place to play, but it's going to be in the manufacture of these components. But if we're going to make a component and use it across multiple sectors millions of times, that's why automation, automation is suddenly quite useful. Uh, on site, we're using a different type of automation. So this is a, this is the prototype where the study was to see how few people we need to erect a superstructure with what level of automation. So you can see here, it's not, you know, six axis robots, it's reach stackers that they use in distribution sheds. But you can see here, color coding of components, very simple processes, little bit of automation. We're measuring things in minutes. Uh, the entire slab is built from the underside. So we're not using precast because that introduces a precast factory and the transport time, et cetera, et cetera. What we're effectively doing is turning the 
site into a factory for building the building, uh, which is like the IKEA analogy is maybe you build your wardrobe in your bedroom where the wardrobe will be. You don't build it in the IKEA factory and bring it to site. So we're starting to look at what level of automation will really drive massive levels of productivity on sites. Um, from this, we get a whole load of benefits from, you know, again, the manufacturing thing, the more you repeat a uh, component, the more effort you can put into optimizing it and therefore the less material and movements and things. So we start to get, this is how we're getting these manufacturing benefits. Uh, we then have an a MEP kit of parts which is designed to clip in very simply. So you get the superstructure up very quickly. You get the MEP in very quickly. You have a facade kit of parts of that follows. So the whole compression uh, of the program is starting to happen. Uh, very last thing, I haven't got time to talk about this particularly, but this is not just a kind of a bride and wood initiative. This has been picked up by UK government. So this came out in December and it's basically saying this is government's plan for how it's going to build its social infrastructure moving forward. So you're going to hear a lot more, I suspect, about platforms. Uh, I've, I've run out of time now, but Phil's very helpfully put lots of links on the uh, LinkedIn. So if that's interesting, there's plenty of uh, other material that you can find there. So uh, thanks for the listening. Tour de force. I was very impressed. Um, that last case study with the, uh, the, the precast concrete, there's, there's a beautiful video that I shared about that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed with all four of the speakers that we've had.